Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. Once again, thanks for joining us again this weekend on the program and for faithfully watching. Set your DVR or your VCR or whatever you can record on if you uh, don't have time to watch us. Uh, depending on which day you watch us at this point, we are on at uh, both Friday at 12.30 p.m. And if you miss it, the Friday program will air again the following Wednesday night at 6 p.m. And that's Eastern Standard Time. But if you miss any of these programs, they are available to you at uh, YouTube. And uh, you can go to YouTube and Google my name or just go to our website. And there's a link straight from my website. And that address will be on the screen that will take you to our YouTube page where we have a channel uh, that you can watch this and go back and say, well, I missed something today and I want to go back and see it again. That's available. You can also go to uh, iTunes and sign up for our podcast and the audio from these programs will be delivered to your uh, iPhone or your iPod or however you do it. And there's also an RSS feed from our website for your Android device so that you can go back and revisit uh, a lot of this stuff. Thank you, though, for uh, your kind words, your responses to us on our public profile page on Facebook, which is simply Lynn Howes Ministries. Go there and like our page. You can also go back and watch uh, on ITBN some of the things that I, ITBN will archive us for a little while if you want to go back and watch those things. We've been talking about the trumpets, and I'm going to get in the Word um, again today. And we dealt with the last uh, segment, the first trumpet. We're dealing with the seven trumpets that are in the book of Revelation. Uh, what set the stage, and let me, let me, let me go back and just read, uh, we'll just begin in uh, verse 7. It says, And the first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees was burned up, and all green grass was burned up. And we dealt with that the last segment. The second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood, and a third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. Now we're going to deal with this one for uh, this particular uh, segment. And I think we'll uh, try to bring some clarity and understanding uh, to what this mountain is. Again, this, is, this one I think will be really, really powerful to us. But as I shared with you before uh, in a prior segment, uh, you know, we talked about, we, we talked about how if you go back, in the last segment, we talked about remember Lot's wife. In other words, the whole message of Lot's wife is don't go back. Now, what we showed you in the last segment is in Revelation, the 11th chapter, in verse 8, it says that their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now, our Lord was not crucified in Sodom or Egypt. Our Lord was crucified in Jerusalem. Now, uh, uh, what the Spirit saw fit to do was make a direct connection between the ancient city of Jerusalem and these apostate Jews who were coming to the judgment that had been prophesied to them that if they did not follow in the ways of the Lord, uh, or uh, that, that all of the plagues of Egypt would literally come upon them. And when you see these trumpets and these vows being poured out, they are the exact, you've, you've no doubt read this. And as you're reading through, you thought, I remember somewhere else in the Bible this is at. Certainly you did. It was in the book of Exodus where all these plagues were coming upon them because they did not put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of their houses and leave that apostate city, that bondage. Now we showed you the last time, again, that in Revelation 11, verse 8, it said that our city where the Lord was crucified is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. Egypt is where the plagues were being poured out. Sodom, we shared with you the last week that we were on, and we shared how that the fire and brimstone that was the first trumpet was the fire and brimstone that fell on apostate Jerusalem and Israel. And in the fulfillment of the words of Jesus where he said it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than it will be for you in the day of judgment. So all of those judgments came upon them. So when this second angel sounds, there's a great mountain that's burning with fire. It's cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea literally becomes like the blood of a dead man. Now, uh, we, we see a, a parallel to this 
this is literally a parallel to the first plague in Egypt in which the Nile was turned into blood and all the fish died. That's in Exodus chapter 7, verse 17 through 21, if you want to read it, in fulfillment of God's covenant promise that all these plagues will come upon you. Now, uh, also, I, one of the things that I saw as well on this one was that God called the nation of Israel the holy mountain or the mountain of God's inheritance. That's Exodus chapter 15, verse number 17. So when we see a great mountain burning with fire cast into the sea, this may not necessarily be talking about a physical mountain somewhere. And I want to show you where this fits together with some of these other uh, uh, prophecies concerning this mountain. Now, uh, I, I wanted to... Uh, 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 just make, let me make this connection. Uh, reading this from my notes, this is what I have in my notes. Matthew chapter 20 through chapter 25 is in the middle of this lengthy series of discourses, literally in parables, about the destruction of Jerusalem. Jesus is in the middle of these uh, lengthy discourses of parables that really are trying to warn He's trying to warn these Jews uh, that uh, uh, there's an impending judgment. He's giving them every opportunity to repent, to receive their Messiah. And he's giving them parables that they should have grasped and understood was talking about them. And they did understand that. That's why they were ready to throng upon him and kill him. But in the middle of this, Jesus uses a couple of symbols of judgment of Israel. And uh, I want to read one of them to you. Luke, the 13th chapter, verse number 6 through 9, it says, And he spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Now, uh, let's think about that a moment. Then said, he unto the, then said he unto the dresser of his vineyards, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none, cut it down, why cumber through the ground? Now, I want you to note, first of all, he's talking about a fig tree, which is also a symbol of natural Israel. When you see the fig tree shaken by a mighty wind, the wind that blew the fig tree was in Acts chapter 2, when the wind of Pentecost blew, it shook this fig tree of a mighty wind. Uh, you also see the fulfillment of that in Revelation chapter 6 when the stars fell from heaven as a, uh, as, a, as a fig tree when it's shaken by a mighty wind. But Jesus comes to this fig tree after three years. He comes to his vine dresser uh, for three years seeking fruit. Now, I don't know whether it dawns on us or not, but Jesus came to this system of religion for three years. He could not find any fruit on it. Let me connect this also with a fig tree being a picture of what Adam used to cover his nakedness with. When he reached for the wrong tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and he ate that fruit, he became aware of his nakedness, he puts on a fig leaf apron. Can I simply say it like this? A fig tree and a fig leaf symbolizes to me man's human effort under law reaching to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to try to produce fruit when the law does not produce fruit. As a matter of fact, Galatians says it shuts up faith. It is a man under an old covenant trying to, uh, with his self-righteousness, his self-help, his fig leaf apron, uh, trying to cover himself. Jesus comes to this fig tree and he comes to the vine dresser and he said, I've come here for three years. And it hasn't produced any fruit. And he said, cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? I believe what he talked about in Matthew, the fourth chapter, he said, now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. He was talking about that tree. It was about to be laid to the root of a tree of human performance and religion that these people were so steeped in, they couldn't break their way out of. Now, when Jesus comes to that fig tree, then they answered him and said unto him, verse 8, uh, Lord, let it alone this year also till I dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Now, Jesus came for three years, and they said, leave it in another year. Jesus' ministry was another year, and uh, or Jesus' ministry was three and a half years. So he literally gave them the opportunity to dig about and to dug this to dung this fig tree to see if it would produce any fruit. Well, you know the end of the story. It didn't produce any fruit. 
And so Jesus curses that fig tree and said it's about to be hewn down and cast into the fire. Now let me read this to you from Matthew chapter 21 and verse number 18. It says, Now in the morning as he returned into the city, he was hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon, but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If you have faith and doubt not, you shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if you shall say unto this mountain, now I want, I, that's specific. Bells and whistles went off in my spirit when I read that. You will say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. It shall be done. And all things whatsoever you ask in prayer believing, you shall receive. Now Jesus is saying to these guys, I came to this fig tree. Now once again, we get in our minds natural things. When a lot, most of the parables and the stuff Jesus is doing is trying to show us a much bigger picture. He comes to a fig tree, a system of religion that cannot produce fruit, has not produced fruit, and will never produce fruit. And he comes to this system and this people so entangled with it, and he says to them, uh, he says he comes looking for fruit we don't find. He curses the fig tree, and they find that tree withered, and they marvel because the fig tree is withered up. And he said, how are you marveling because the fig tree? You, if you have faith, if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed. I have a whole chapter about this in my book titled Unforced Rhythms of Grace. That's a powerful series. Uh, but when he says that, uh, you know, he just if you have faith, in other words, I mean, the old covenant uh, was not a system of faith. It was a system of works. As a matter of fact, the writer of Galatians says that we were, uh, while the law shuts up faith, that we were shut up under the law until the faith would come. So uh, that old covenant didn't take any faith. I think it's interesting in the book of Hebrews, especially the 11th chapter, when you're reading the heroes of faith, it talks about by faith Moses kept the Passover. By faith Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. By faith he uh, left Egypt because he esteemed the riches of Christ greater uh, and the reproach of Christ greater than the riches of Egypt. But it leaves off with Moses' life. Uh, after literally they've come to the place where God brought them out of Egypt, he never mentions anything from uh, the wilderness journey until the very next thing he mentions in the book of Hebrews is about them coming into Jericho and Rahab the harlot receiving by faith. Because from the time of the end uh, Moses bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt, they come to the wilderness, and it's in the wilderness that God gives them the law. And from there until Jericho, there is nothing that happens in that segment that's mentioned in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, the great hall of faith. And the reason for that is because the whole time they're under law, there's no faith involved. It's all performance. It's all obedience. It's all curses. And when you are under the law, it, you are shut up under the faith that would be revealed. And the faith did not come on the scene again until they're about to enter their promised land in Jericho. Because while they're under law, it is not a faith. So he says, if you simply got faith, so this new covenant, the only requirement of the new covenant is that you believed. As a matter of fact, when Jesus said this, when they asked him, what must we do to work the works of God. He said, uh, simply believe on him whom he has sent. The only work of God is to believe. Now, let me say this. There's so much to preach that it's hard to do it all in just a short segment. Uh, but let me say this to you is that, uh, um, you know, faith is the issue here. It, you know, uh, once again, he says, you know, uh, that here is the work, that you believe on him whom he has said. But right believing will produce right living. So faith does produce the fruit. The other stuff doesn't produce fruit. Works, labor, and sweat are called the works of the flesh, where Galatians talks about the fruit of the Spirit. 
So under the law, and if you look at that in the context, even in Galatians, where he says, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free, be not again entangled in the yoke of bondage. I always heard that preacher says, don't go back to the world after you get saved. That's not what he's talking about. The context there in Galatians is, you're coming up out of law. Chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4 of Galatians is Paul pleading with these Galatians, who has bewitched you, don't go back to the law. And then he comes in and says, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free. Be not again entangled in the yoke of bondage. Because he tells them in chapter 1 and 2 of the book of Galatians, when we were in, under the law, we were in the flesh. Romans 5 says the same thing. When we were under the law, we were in the flesh. Uh, he tells them in chapter 1, you started out in the Spirit. Do you think you're going to be made perfect in the flesh? He tells them, did you work miracles by the works of the law, or did you do it by the hearing of faith? And so he tells them that the works, see, one of the aspects of the works of the flesh is if you're up under law, you're going to get the works of the flesh, which are hatred, malice, envy, strife, division, stuff you see in every church, because that's what the law produces. Romans 5 says that when the commandment comes, sin revive, and I died. And Paul talked about in that same chapter that when that law came, it stirred up in him covetousness, and, and it's one of the works of the flesh. So if you're up under law, you're going to produce the works of the flesh. You're going to have self-righteousness. You might look holy. You may look like a fig tree that's got some fruit on it, but it doesn't have any fruit. It's just a good front. But the fruit of the Spirit is a fruit that is a result of being connected to the right root. The Spirit of Christ will produce real fruit in your lives. Make no mistake about it. Those of us who are preaching grace are not trying to give you a license to sin. We're trying to point you to the Holy Spirit that will really produce the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Now, when Jesus is cursing this fig tree, then he comes also and says, you'll not only say to the fig tree, if you've got faith, but you'll say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. I submit to you that the mountain that he was talking about was this mountain that God called in Exodus 15, his holy mountain. He was about talking about a cursing a system and removing a mountain that was about to be cast into the sea. Now, let me, let me show you this also. He said, you'll be able to say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. He wasn't just talking about, uh, you know, just the mountains in your life. He was talking about this mountain. Now, let's read this. Hebrews 12, verse 17 through 22 says, For you know how that afterward... When he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. For you are not come to the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, and to blackness and darkness and tempest. Now remember, this mountain in Revelation is a mountain that burned with fire. Exact same wording. He said, you did not come to the mountain that burned with fire. That's Old Covenant. That's Old Covenant mountain. That's Old Covenant law, the mount that burned with fire. It's a direct connection to Hebrews 12. Uh, he said that it might be touched with black. You didn't come to the, uh, the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words which they that heard entreated that the words should not be spoken to them anymore, for they could endure, could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it would be stoned or thrust through with the dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake, but you are come to Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God and to the heavenly Jerusalem and to an innumerable company of angels. I submit to you that this trumpet is talking about this mountain that burned with fire. He's talking about an old covenant. And I I believe what he's saying is that you can come to a mountain that operates by faith, not by works. You can come to a mountain that is not a mountain of bondage. You can come to this mountain, and if you've got faith, you'll not only be able to uh, speak to a fig tree, but you also be able to say to this mountain, be removed to be cast into the sea. I submit to you it's the same mountain that Zechariah talked about when he said, Who art thou, O great mountain that stands before Zerubbabel? But you're going to be cast into the sea because someone is going to shout grace, grace to you. I'm telling you there is a message of grace that's being released right now in this planet that is casting the mountain of law and legalism and an old covenant mountain and the people that were connected with it in this historic setting that literally cast that mountain into the sea. You say, well, what sea is that? It's the sea of forgetfulness. God said your sins in the new covenant. See, you can cast this mountain into the sea because here's the covenant. He said, I will make with you after those days, saith God. I'm going to write my laws on your hearts and upon your minds. I will write them and your sins and iniquities. I will remember no more. They'll be removed as far as the east is from the west, from one nailed scarred hand to the other. And he will cast it 
into the sea. I submit to you that's what's happening under the sounding of this second trumpet is that it is fulfillment of that mountain that is the mountain that burned with fire. It is the removing of an apostate Israel, the fig tree. It is the removing of the mountain that God called the holy mountain of Israel. And God was giving birth as he caused that one to pass off the scene. He said, you have not come to this one, but you have come to Mount Zion and you've come to the city of the living God. The third trumpet is uh, uh, the trumpet that goes on. The third trumpet said, The third angel sounded, there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the stars called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. I, let me see if I can kind of cover this one as quickly as I can. The third trumpet to me uh, is a symbol of... Uh, uh, of the uh, in Exodus chapter seven verse twenty one, this is similar to the first plague that's in Egypt, in which the waters became bitter because of the multitude of dead and, dec uh, and decaying fish. So again, connect that to the city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. This is a direct connection to the fact that it was God pouring out his plagues upon that. Now also, I wanted to bring this out, and I know I probably shouldn't have bit, bit this off with just a few minutes left in the program, but uh, uh, this is a symbol of the vision of the third trumpet combines biblical imagery from the fall of both Egypt and Babylon. Uh, the great star that fell from heaven in Isaiah chapter 14, verse number 12 through 15, is called Lucifer. But if you read in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 through 15, if you just look this word up, it'll tell you Lucifer is not the devil. It is a symbolic name for the king of Babylon. In the book of Revelation, Jesus connects this city of Babylon, the great harlot, once again with his apostate Israel that is coming under judgment. And so when he's talking about the fall of the king of Babylon, it is in response to apostate Israel uh, and where also our Lord was crucified. And so when I start to say, if you read that in the book of Isaiah, it'll tell you it's the king of Babylon. It's not the devil. Isaiah 14 is not talking about the devil. As a matter of fact, Lucifer is only ever mentioned twice in the scripture, once in Ezekiel and once in the book of Isaiah. And if you just look it up, it'll tell you in most commentaries and most books, this is not the devil. It was, if it was the devil, even there it says, art thou fallen from heaven? And it talks to him, you know, it talks about him being cut down to the grave. The devil never went down to the grave, never went down to the sides of the pit. It was talking about this, uh, uh, it was talking about this fall of a king. So it was talking about the destruction of a kingdom. It was talking about the destruction of Babylon. It was talking about, it's connecting this to the destruction of Babylon, which is a picture of apostate Israel. Uh, let me just read, uh, uh, the wormwood is also connected. Uh, it's also connected to Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 18 through 24, where it says this, lest there be any among you, man or woman or family or tribe, whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God to go and serve gods of these nations. And uh, lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. Wormwood falls upon this, and it come to pass that when he heareth the words of this curse, that he bless himself in his heart and shall say, I shall have peace, though I walk in the imagination of my own heart and drunkenness to thirst. This is an absolute, complete fulfillment of where the Scripture says, men will say, uh, when they cry peace and safety, then comes sudden destruction as of a woman in travail. They're saying in their hearts, uh, look, I, I'm going to bless myself in my heart, and I've got peace in the imaginations of my heart, and in my drunkenness, and in my thirst. And he's saying to them, what's going to happen is, is that these curses are going to come upon them. The gall of wormwood and the bitterness of the water. The Lord will not spare him, but then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smoke against that man. And all the curses that are written in the book shall lie upon him, and the Lord shall blot his name out from under heaven. That is an absolute fulfillment of what God gave to this covenant people under uh, the law that they agreed to in the book of Deuteronomy was that wormwood would come, the gall of wormwood, and that it would come upon them. That's happening under the operation of this trumpet. And the Lord shall separate him unto evil out of all the tribes according to all the curses of the covenant that are written in the book of the law, so that the generations to come of your children shall rise up after you, and a stranger shall come from the land of far, that when they see the plagues of 
And when they shall see the plagues of that land and the sicknesses which the Lord hath laid upon it, and the whole land thereof is brimstone and salt and burning, that is not sown nor beareth nor any grass groweth therein, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboam, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and his wrath. Even all nations shall say, Wherefore hath the Lord done this unto this land? What meaneth the heat of this great anger? I'm telling you, that's the fulfillment of the, of the brimstone and the fire and the burning and the salt. He compares that to Sodom and Gomorrah. He compares that to the fall of Babylon. He compares it to the fall of uh, uh, these people who are up under this law. I'm about to run out of time, but Jeremiah 9, verse 15 says this, Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will feed them, even this people, with wormwood, and give them water of gall to drink. I will scatter them also among the heathen, whom neither they nor their fathers have known, and I will send a sword after them until they have been consumed. That's the fulfillment of this trumpet is the wormwood and the bitterness and the waters have become polluted. It is God keeping his end of the covenant bargain. I don't know about you. I don't know why you'd want to fight and hold on to these things that was about to pass away. I'm going to say to this mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea. I'm not under law. I'm not I'm under that fig tree that's cursed. I've received what Jesus did. My faith has brought me into another place and I'm believing God and my faith is what brings me into a salvation that was ready to be revealed in this last time. I hope you can see the fulfillment of these. I feel like I'm kind of rushing a little bit, but I hope you're being blessed. Tune in again next week. We're about to run out of time. Take a moment to call that number on the screen. Uh, go to our website and sow a seed into the ministry. It is your faithful partnership and gifts that help us take the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of His grace around the world. We need your help, and it is you, that our faithful partners, that are enabling us to do that. Tell your friends about us. Set your DVR or whatever you got to do to tune in again next week and uh, we say God bless you. Our prayer is that God's favor and blessing will be upon you. You're not under a curse. You're under a blessing. God bless you. For anyone struggling to understand John's writings in Revelation, this book provides true, biblically based answers. Through detailed insights into the letters John wrote to the seven churches of his day, you will learn how to avoid the mistakes of the early church to overcome today's trials and tribulations. This book will provoke you to thought and dialogue, bringing greater clarity and revelation of Jesus Christ.